and immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, Don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more, so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. What was the ending verse? Sorry. 32. Okay. So we're... Okay. One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who spreads blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus went. Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in the front, up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, "We have never, we we have seen, <laughs> we have seen remarkable things today." After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for the for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who belonged to their sect, complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, So that verse uh, we're working on memorizing is interesting because it pretty much personifies the the first section of Jesus' ministry. Um, But about a month ago, Lewis was preaching through the the text in Luke, and he had the passage where Jesus encounters a demon-possessed man. And so the demon-possessed man, of course, was scary, uh, whether it was mental illness or most likely mental illness layered on top of demon possession. Um, most of the time, like the guy possessed by Legion in the Bible, you remember that story? Uh, these people were presu- uh, often had supernatural strength, uh, isolated themselves. It says with the guy who was possessed by Legion tore chains that people bound him with. And um, people were just freaked out and afraid of him. And so... Uh, Jesus goes and ministers to a demon-possessed man. In the text today, he goes and ministers to a leper who freaked people out in a different way. Uh, And then he goes on to minister to a paralytic who didn't freak people out necessarily, but was judged by people because the assumption was there had to be sin in that man's life or sin in his family to cause him to be a paralytic. And then he goes out of his way to meet a guy named Matthew or Levi, the tax collector, who was also hated by people. And so the first thing we want to look at is this idea of an outcast and how the people viewed these outcasts, and then how Jesus viewed these outcasts, and then how Jesus views us, because in a sense, we're all kind of outcasts in one way, shape, or form. And so the first thing, Jesus encounters this leper. Um, this man here has leprosy. So leprosy is um, it's one of the oldest diseases, if not the oldest disease that we have historically recorded. And it's a, it's a bacterial infection. And so when, back to, when you have this disease... Um, it does a couple things. One, it can cause like just different cutaneous lesions on your body that ooze. And then um, it's, a, it's nerve degenerative. So um, you lose limbs a lot of the times. One, like your connective tissue dissolves. And so that's, what, that's where the knuckling happens. And then you lose limbs often because when you don't feel like, you know, having pain sensors are what keeps you from something. You know, you touch a stove, you, you recoil because it's hot. If you're a leper, you don't know to recoil. So... You, you wound yourself, the wound gets infected, that bacterial 
um, infection spreads and you lose the limb. Uh, you literally are the walking dead. It was a horrible, horrible disease. And often you go blind because again, you know to blink because nerves in your eyes say, hey, your eyes are getting dry, blink. When you don't have those nerves in your eyes, you don't know to blink, so your eyes actually dry out and you go blind. So it was horrible, and not just horrible, but stigmatizing, not just stigmatizing, but ostracizing, because if you had leprosy, everyone thought you were contagious, because you were. And so there were rules in Leviticus, not because the Bible's mean, but because so much of the law was just to keep the Israelites alive while they were on this journey to the promised land. And so it says, the leprous, pers leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. So this is how you had to dress if you were a leper. You had to dress like someone who's in mourning, mourning for the dead, because literally you were like walking death. You weren't allowed to be around people if you were in the infective stage. And quite often, historically, you often, the only place you could live was in a leper colony with other people. And so uh, that's who this man is when he comes and approaches Jesus. And what's interesting, so I have a science background, so like things in the Bible that are scientific, kind of I nerd out on them. It's interesting that the command was to cover your upper lip in some translations is to cover your mouth and say unclean, unclean. Isn't that, that's kind of random. Just in the last 20 years, they realized that leprosy is spread through aerosol. Your spit is what spreads it. So it's just interesting when you see way back then, they didn't know that, but God knew that. And so to prevent infestation or the, the uh, emission of the, 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 the bacteria, you had to cover your mouth and say, unclean, unclean, to warn people without infecting people, which is just really kind of awesome. It's almost like when, um, you know, now if you have a baby, like they give you a vitamin K shot because it causes your blood to coagulate. Well, back then you had to wait eight days for your blood to coagulate. So you didn't circumcise a kid as soon as he was born because he died. And so you'd have to wait eight days till the blood could, you know, just biologically coagulate. Things like that. I think they're kind of interesting, but that's besides the point. What's sad about this man is he comes to Jesus and um, he's going to be definitely coming from a place uh, where he's ostracized by the people. And it says he was full of leprosy. So it wasn't a minor case, because if you read the whole, the Le Le Leviticus goes into great detail on what leprosy looks like, what it is, what it isn't, when it's probably contagious, when it's not contagious. He didn't have a minor case. He didn't have like eczema, because sometimes leprosy is just put on all skin diseases. He was full of leprosy. So he was very leprous, oozing probably, scary looking. Um, the disease was very advanced in this man. He was ashamed, no doubt. He was alone and he was afraid because also if, if a leper got too close to you, historically you could stone them to death and, 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 and to protect yourself. And so he's entering a crowded city where he's not supposed to be pursuing Jesus who had no previous example of healing a leper that wasn't really in Jesus's bio yet. And so he doesn't even know this is possible. There was no invitation from the disciples. Hey, come meet Jesus. He'll heal you of your leprosy. Um, there was no promise that he'd be healed also or be made clean. The only thing we per he maybe had to go on was Jesus's first sermon. Remember we looked at a couple weeks ago. He used an example of naming the leper. So maybe, this is total speculation, maybe someone said, hey, Jesus talked about lepers. You should meet this Jesus guy if he ever pops up in your area. So nonetheless, he had faith that Jesus could heal him. He says, if you are willing, almost like saying, if your will, not my will, is to heal me, I know you can do it, Jesus. But not just heal me, I want to be made clean. Because he, his whole life, had to warn people that he was unclean. And he's like, I just want to be normal. I just want to be clean. I want to be clean in the sight of people. I want to be accepted back in society. I want to be clean in the sight of God. And that was a simple request. And so the leper is an outcast who's ostracized by the people because of his disease. And he comes to Jesus. Next, there's a story that Luke read of the paralytic. Now, this one's a little more famous because it's covered in other um, accounts as well. Remember, there's a big crowd. Every, anywhere Jesus preached, there was a, a, a huge crowd of people. In this case, there are scribes and Pharisees that are also listening, not liking Jesus because he's, got, he's building momentum. They're the religious leaders. They don't like anybody else being the religious leader. 
And it says many times in scripture that they envied Jesus and the platform that he had. And so they're sitting there listening, hoping to find Jesus in error of scripture as he preaches. And the crowd's huge, right? And so these guys have this paralyzed friend and they're trying to get him to Jesus and they can't. And so back then when you had houses, you, you, you could often sit on the, the roof of your house when it was um, in the evening and you wanted to cool off because you could catch a breeze up there. So what they did was they, they went around the staircase, got to the roof, and they ripped it open and just dropped the guy in the middle of Jesus' sermon. You know, imagine ceiling parts falling, you know, hay falling out of the way, and this guy just gets lowered in. Jesus sees him and recognizes the faith of his friends. But prior to that, this man would have been judged by the people because I said in John 9, 1, when it came to disability, most of the time the people were very judgmental and they assumed that you had to sin for God to punish you in that way with that specific disability. In John 9, 1, if you remember that story, um, when a man was blind from birth, his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So this is a common misconception about any form of um, disease or paralysis or any um, handicap that you had to make God mad for him to judge you and do that. And that's, what, that's the assumption. It's bad enough this guy can't work. It's bad enough he's probably a beggar. But on top of it all, there's an assumption that he's got hidden sin or his family has hidden sin, and that's why he's disabled. And so perhaps that's why no one made a clear path for him. Like, well, we don't, there's no compassion extended to you because obviously you're, you're hiding sin. And so, no, we're not going to move out of the way. You know, so. so this paralytic was judged by the people. So the leper ostracized by the people, the paralytic judged by the people. And then there's the tax collector. Now, tax collectors were loathed by the people. They were hated by Jews. If you were a tax collector, you were considered a traitor because you worked for the Roman government. And the Roman government, that wasn't like a fun government. That wasn't like, oh, we're so glad we have Roman protection. No, they were, it was a, an awful regime that you know, ruled with an iron fist. And so they had to force people to pay them taxes and so often they'd use Jews who could speak the language and understood and knew the people, reinforced, like backed up by Roman soldiers, that was the muscle, to basically extort you for money. And the way you made profit as a tax collector is if the Roman government wanted 10%, you could charge, charge as much as you want above that, and that was yours to keep. So if Caesar said, hey, Michael, collect 10% from the people, I'm like, okay, I will. And he's like, and whatever you want above that is yours. Great, I'd say it's 25%, that's what you have to pay. 10%, and you couldn't ask questions about where it went, but you knew it went to me. You knew there was a cut I was taking. And so they were considered extortioners because they could keep whatever they overcollected. And they were wealthy. They amassed a fortune doing this. So nobody was more hated than a tax collector. Even in Matthew 18, which is you know, the guidelines for how to rebuke a person who's in sin, it says if you've went to somebody... And, and called them back to repentance, and they ignore you. It says, take a friend and go to them. And say, hey, bro, you're living in sin. You've got to stop this. And they ignore that friend and you. It says, get a, get a pastor. Get somebody who's a you know, leader of the church. So now it's three of us. Hey, bro, you've got to come back to the Lord. And he ignores all three of you. It says, forget you guys. I don't want to do that. Then it says, treat him like a pagan or a tax collector. So even Jesus knows that when he really wants to kind of deliver a punch, okay, this is a bad person that you need to now switch into Operation Evangelism with. They're not a Christian. So don't treat them like one. Treat them like a pagan or a tax collector. So that was the cultural viewpoint of a tax collector. Tax collectors were loathed by the people, and Jesus knew that. So here we're dealing with people. The, 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 the demoniac was feared by the people. The leper was ostracized by the people. The paralytic was judged by the people. And the tax collector, Matthew, was loathed by the people. So you've got these outcasts that are hated by society, and yet when it comes to Jesus, his approach to them and his attitude towards them is radically different. He loved the leper. Now, Numbers 5, 1 through 3 said this, says this, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the people of Israel 
that they put out of the camp everyone who is leprous or has a discharge and everyone who is unclean through contact with the dead. So it, it links lepers and anybody who touches a dead person in the same group. You shall put out both male and female, putting them outside the camp that they may not defile their camp in the midst of which I dwell. So you had no connection to the people of God and no connection to God himself because he was in the tabernacle. That was where he dwelt. You couldn't worship. You couldn't be in community. You were exiled because of your disease. And that's who this man embodied. That's who he was. And Jesus doesn't just heal him. Jesus does a lot of weird things when he heals people. Sometimes he just speaks it. Sometimes he makes a weird spit poultice and puts it in your eyes and heals you that way. He does all kinds of, he doesn't ever heal the same way quite often. There's just a variety of ways. He intentionally touches the leper, which is significant because we don't know the last time this man's been touched. Probably never by someone who didn't have leprosy. And so Jesus chooses to use touch as the modality in which this man is healed. And then he sends him on a mission. He doesn't just heal him and say, all right, see you later. He's like, all right, I want you to go to the high priest and make an offering. Now, this is really beautiful because this is restorative. If you, in the 1% chance, got healed of your leprosy, it almost was never healed back then. This almost never happened. It's never even recorded happening in scripture unless God miraculously healed a leper. There was no medicine. Now you, you, can, you take a cocktail of antibiotics that wipes out leprosy. We can deal with it now. Three, four thousand, two thousand years ago, you could not. And so if you were healed, though, this is the pathway to restoration in Leviticus 14. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall look. Then if the case of leprous disease is healed from the leprous person, the priest shall command them to take for him, who is to be cleansed, two live clean birds, and cedar wood, and scarlet yarn, and hyssop. And the priest shall command them to kill one of the birds in an earthenware vessel, over fresh water. I guarantee you the priest would have never done this or had this done because lepers weren't healed back then. And he's saying, hey, I'm not just going to heal you. I'm not just going to make you clean. I'm going to restore your position in the community. So go to the priest, show him that you no longer have leprosy, do what the Levitical law says to do, and be part of the synagogue again. So how beautiful is that? The guy just wanted to be clean. Jesus makes him clean, restores him from his sin, and gives him a position back in community. So Jesus always goes further. And it's messy in some cases because what he's calling him to do is hard. He had to approach the priests. Again, there's historical documentation of priests chucking rocks at lepers as they came to them because these were the holiest guys of all. You definitely didn't come to a priest. And so this guy would have known all that. So Jesus called him to do something hard and challenging, but he gave him a mission, which is really beautiful. God doesn't just heal you and save you and restore you. He wants to use you uniquely with the giftings, the passions, the past. All those things come together in the form of mission in your life. And we see that with a leper. He also loved the paralytic. The paralytic, it's the man's friends, which is really beautiful, were determined to get him in front of Jesus and Jesus moved by their visible faith. The one thing that stands out to Jesus time and time again in Scripture is someone's faith. He doesn't care who the faith belongs to. In this case, it belongs to the friends. He sees faith of the centurion. He's always impressed by a person's faith. And he's like, wow, these guys were persistent. They needed to get their friend to me. And come hell or high water, they were going to do it, even if it meant tearing a hole in someone's roof, which again makes the miracle kind of messy. One thing to get used to in scripture and one thing to get used to in your walk with God and one thing to get used to with a biblical concept of God is sometimes it's messy. It's not always neat. Like what God calls you to, what he takes you from, your salvation process, your sanctification process, it's often messy with highs and lows and ups and downs and lapses in your faith and lapses in your belief in God. Most of the Psalms, as I said, were lamentations, which means they're questions to God. How long, O oh Lord? Why? Why are you doing this? And these open-ended questions because it's frustrating and God doesn't work on your time frame. And these miracles are all kind of messy also. This one maybe not as severe as a 
a priest seeing a leper coming at him and wanting to chuck a stone at you. But this is just, nobody ever goes into like who fixed the guy's roof, but no one really cares. As soon as this guy is healed, his unique mission is, hey, rise up, take up your mat and go home. In other, in other passages, it says, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has shown mercy on you. That was the specific calling. And so it's this beautiful picture again of somebody who was helpless. Somebody who couldn't do anything without his friend's help. Now, not just being forgiven, because that was what Jesus said. He didn't say, I heal you. He said, I forgive you of your sins and I'll heal you. And I've got a specific mission to your family. Go home to them. Let them see you fully restored and tell them that I'm the one who did it. I'm the one who showed mercy on you. So certainly salvation. I mean, imagine your child, probably born a paralytic, has been a paralytic his whole life, and now he comes in, you know, skipping home. When he connects that to Jesus, we don't know the story. It doesn't go into that. But I'm certain many of his family members came to Christ. And then with the tax collector, he didn't just love the paralytic, he didn't just love the leper, he loved the tax collector too. He told Levi, he said, follow me. And he understood, he knew almost everybody hated tax collectors. It's beautiful to see how Jesus loved someone who is very easy to hate. And he calls him and it says Levi left everything. It's one thing to leave your fishing rod behind or your fishing nets and your ghetto apartment or whatever Peter lived in. He didn't have a lot of money. Matthew had a lot of money. He had a lot to leave behind and he did it in a second. And the last thing he did was to throw a huge party for his friends so all his tax collector buddies, tax collector buddies could come meet Jesus. When he realized who Jesus was and realized that all the money he had, all the power he had, all the comfort he had it was nothing compared to what he had in Christ. The mission on earth, the eternity with the people of God, with God himself, it was a no-brainer. He left it all. Much more to leave than any of the fishermen. Much more to leave than any of the other disciples. He had the most to lose, but in his eyes, it was the most to gain. So his mission was specific. Not everyone got to follow Jesus. And Jesus said, your mission is going to be to follow me. And part of doing that was to bring his friends. So he threw a dinner party and wanted to get as many of the people as he knew that were okay with him in the presence of Jesus. And I just put, you know, Peter, James, and John could go, this is a, a, a theologian named Wessel. He said, Peter, James, and John could more easily go back to their fishing business. Their fish always around. Just get a different fishing pole. Uh, it would be very hard for Levi to go back to tax collecting. Tax collector jobs were greatly sought after as a sure way to get rich quickly. So as soon as you quit the job, you don't, you don't jump back in. It was over. And he didn't care. And so he left all. And it's messy because there's archaeological evidence that fish taken from the Sea of Galilee were taxed. So Jesus took for his disciple a tax collector who would have collected taxes from fishermen who also didn't like him. And it was okay with Jesus. He didn't care about mixing up. Uh, the lineup when it came to, his, came to his disciples. And so again, a leper who's ostracized, loved by Jesus, restored, made clean, sent on mission. A paralytic, most likely, judged by the people. He certainly got hidden sin. Forgiven by Jesus, healed by Jesus, sent home on mission. And a tax collector, loathed by the people, hated nefarious, nobody liked tax collectors. Jesus loved him, gave him a command, not just, to, not just to quit your business, but to follow me and my unique ministry for the next three and a half years, and so he did. And so like the leper, our sin, because this is all a backdrop of what sin looks like and what sin does. So like the leper, our sin can isolate, ostracize, desensitize, blind, and slowly destroy us, keeping us from God. Like the paralytic, our sin can paralyze, stigmatize, and also keep us from God, just like he wasn't able to enter that place because of all the people. Sin paralyzes and keeps us from God. Like the tax collector, sin is pleasurable for a season, the Bible says, it makes that clear, but it's insatiable. Because the Bible says you have eternity in your heart. Nothing temporal can satisfy you. 
Nothing. No amount of money, no pleasure, no form of hedonism, no level of comfort on earth can satisfy the longing in your heart because you're eternal. Only something eternal can satiate that. And despite all these shortcomings that we embody, we're like the leper, we're like the paralytic, we're like the tax collector, Jesus still cares and wants to rescue and restore us. And so maybe in the past or maybe today, or maybe it ebbs and flows, sometimes you feel unclean, condemned by, condemned by God and man. Sometimes you feel that Jesus would never touch you, heal you, much less use you in a unique way. Uh, you feel like God is far away sometimes, hard to know, hard to touch, hard to understand. Maybe you feel caught up in the rat race, the insatiable quest for success, for comfort, for recognition, for power. I think when we look at the story again, we recognize there's no sin, there's no level of brokenness, there's no level of ugliness that's outside the grace of God. He's always there when we respond to him in his call in our life. And he wants to restore us. He wants to forgive us. And he wants to put us back in community. And he wants to use us. That's what I think is beautiful in every single instance. It's not just accept Jesus and collect seashells by the seashore and retire. It's accept Jesus and I want to use you. Like that's the whole reason I do this. Why do pastors preach? The Bible says that God gave apostles and prophets and evangelists for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Like ministry is often, oh, that's what pastors do. But again, ministry is what we all do as the church. Everybody has a ministry. Everybody's called to live on mission. It just looks different. And it, ebbs, it's, it evolves. And sometimes it's specific for a short period of time. And then God calls you somewhere else. And sometimes maybe it's one thing for the rest of your life. We don't know. The missions, it's all different. One went to the high priest. One went home. One followed Jesus. It always looks different. And so calls to action, application. I didn't preach on this part, but it was interesting right in the middle of all of that busyness and all of that potential revival where everything was buzzing and crowds were marveling at Jesus' preaching and marveling at the miracles. He would leave it all and go pray, isolate himself, remove himself from the, uh, the equation to recharge and to reconnect and we, if, if that was Jesus, then how much more do we need to be like that? And how challenging it is in a busy city like New York to pause, to pray. And so ask yourself, how was my prayer life this past week? And it was terrible. What can I do to improve it this next week? And then like last week, we see in this text that healing and restoration are, are always followed by specific mission a call to action, even if the people, they weren't qualified. I mean, the leper didn't go to seminary. The paralytic didn't know the scriptures super well, I'm sure. Matthew was greedy. That's why he got into tax collecting in the first place. And yet Jesus wanted to use all of them. They just had to obey and step out wherever he called them to go. So is God calling you, one, to be restored? Is there a certain sin that you need to continue to ask Jesus to help you with or ask a brother or sister in Christ to help you with or hold you accountable to? Or is there a specific mission that you know you're supposed to do? Maybe someone you know you're supposed to pray for. Maybe someone you know you're supposed to talk to. The tax collector, it was just his friends. It was easy. I don't think you have to go on the street and pass out tracts unless that's your thing. That's not how I operate. I operate who's around me. It's the people I do personal training with. It's the people sometimes in my fashion world, my little side hustles. Those are the people I'm organically connected to. That's my mission field. Sometimes God calls you to places far away. More often than not, it's just the people right there in your sphere of influence. The people you work with, the people in your family, your friends. Those are the people we're to be praying for. Those are the people we're to be looking for opportunities to live a life that's peculiar enough in a positive way that they ask questions and we're ready to give them answers. That we're willing to have conversations to speak the truth in a loving way. And so ask yourself that we should never be, we should never stop asking Jesus, God, what do you want me to do? Not just my job, that's part of what I do, 
But on a, on a larger level, what do you want me to do? Who do you want me to speak to? Who do you want me to pray for? Who do you want me to love? Who do you want me to serve? What do you want me to do? So let's pray. So God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these pictures that we get of what mission looks like. We thank you for these pictures of compassion, how you go and you love the unlovable from frightening demon-possessed people that you, you go after to lepers who are contagious and yet you touch them to paralytics that people ignore and yet you pause your preaching to heal somebody and to forgive them of their sins to a tax collector that nobody likes and yet you love. And we thank you that we've all done things that are ugly. We've all done things that deserve exile. We've all done things that deserve rebuke and punishment. And yet you still come after us, God. We thank you for that, God. May we always be surrendered, not just in the sense of salvation, but always be sent, surrendered to you in the sense of sanctification, when you help us work out our salvation with fear and trembling, when we grow, seasons where we're running, seasons where we're crawling, God, help us to continue to run the race set before us. We ask that in your name, Jesus. Amen. So one thing I think that as we respond, it's important always to pause. And um, again, I stress it a lot, but it's just Everybody knows this. It's just a busy city, and it's rare to have moments where you contemplate. One of the most ancient practices, Christian practices, was contemplation, where you just paused, and you were still, and you just sat there, and you just thought about what God might be doing in your life. You reflected, and it's hard in a busy city to do that, and so we at least want to give one minute just to reflect on things that God might have been saying to you through the week, things he might have said through what we sung, things that he might have said through the sermon. So let's pause in silence for a minute.